So, the interesting trauma goes back a long way. Uh, I had a fairly ordinary childhood with a few traumatising events. These kind of things wouldn't traumatise me as an adult, but they did as a child. So even loving parents don't really have an idea of what traumatises small children. I've always had an interest in post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm sure my father suffered that when I was growing up in the 1950s, as he had served in the war. Later in life as a therapist, I found talking therapy sometimes re-traumatising for clients, particularly trauma survivors who were processing haunting images. I found trauma, trauma therapy, uh, something else was needed other than just talking. So when I trained in EMDR um, about a year and a half ago, part of my experience was trying to work with simple trauma, people who had a simple adult trauma. And I found them very difficult to find because most of them had traumatic events in childhood and some attachment difficulties. So these are some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to have a look at the brain, uh, the anatomy, physiology of the brain. We're going to talk about neuroplasticity and how the brain interacts with the environment as it's developing. We're going to talk about the structures in the brains, that, the brain that are of particular interest to us, and uh, a little bit about the stress response. We're also going to look at attachment, normal attachment, abnormal attachment, and how the window of tolerance develops. We'll have a look at chronically traumatised children, and I work with adults, so I see them as adults who are traumatised and who have post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, which is the extreme of trauma. Then talk a wee bit about trauma therapy today, and then there'll be time for a, a discussion and a little bit about how therapists look after themselves. And very little of this work is my own original work. This is built in the work for ma very many disciplines, neurobiology, there's some Eastern philosophy in there, developmental psychology, psychotherapy and child psychiatry. And a list of great people here whose work that I've drawn on tonight. And there's a full list of references at the end of your handouts there that you can do a bit of further reading yourselves. <coughs> so first of all, just a few words about neuroplasticity. So this is the ability of the brain to be responsive to the environment and change its structure as it interacts dynamically. The brain really has always been of interest to humans and during the 1800s, the mid-1800s, if people became injured in their brains, they could find out which part of the brain dealt with which part of the body, what function it had by its injury. And a chap called Phineas Gage worked in the American Railroads, and those of you who studied psychology will know about Phineas Gage. He ended up with a very large metal rod through his frontal lobe. And from that they found out a little bit about how the frontal lobes worked in humans, when they saw how his personality changed. So in the 1900s, um, Broca and Wernick were discovering the areas of the brain for speech. And then Broadman started to label parts of the brain uh, with 52 different regions, and they are still used in medicine today. But the brain was seen as being very fixed, very static, and really what you were born with uh, didn't change very much. And the whole idea was that the brain wasn't actually capable of change, that we had a fixed number of neurons, and gradually, once you got to your 20s, they all started to die off and it was all downhill. Until recently then. Um, so, in 2004, um, the Dalai Lama was very interested to find out about Western science and invited five eminent scientists along, um, really who were all interested in psychology and how the brain worked. And they had a, an interchange of knowledge 
Um, one of the scientists was actually Fred Gage, who's a descendant of Phineas Gage, just by coincidence. And at this time in the West, technology, uh, with technology with PET scans, uh, with functional MRIs, we could actually see the workings of the brain for the first time, see the parts that were lighting up as they were getting used. There was also quite a prolific supply of war veterans and traumatised people to do studies on. So research really has taken off in the last 10 years. And for the first time, we've got some sound scientific information about how the brain works and in which to base our practice. Because the cells in the brain don't divide like the other cells in their body, for a long time it was thought um, that there were no new cells. However, they found that neurogenesis was actually happening in the brain and actually stem cells were getting regenerated right in the centre of the brain in the ventricles. And it might be of consolation to members of the audience who are over 50 years of age that even in 50, 60 and 70 year olds, this neurogenesis is taking place. Every day we're producing between 500 and 1,000 new brain cells. And as long as we're taking exercise and stimulating our brains, these cells are absorbed into the function of our brains. Other things that the scientists brought in the dialogue with the Dalai Lama, um, they had decided, they had discovered that people who were deaf, who were no longer using this part of their cortex, actually started to use their vision and their peripheral vision much more, and reallocated the parts that had been used for hearing to vision. Found in uh, blind people who were using uh, Braille that this index finger took up much more space in the brain than the other fingers did. So the brain adjusted and shifted what it did. And when the blind people were reading Braille, they started to use the, the visual cortex at the back of their head that would have been redundant. The other thing they found was that people who had strokes and had lost some of their physical function, if they carried on stimulating the arm or the leg, another part of the brain would take over that function. The infant brain is particularly malleable um, and dedicated function, but it still works in older people. So up until that point it had been clear that the brain could alter the mind. And then it was starting to become clear that the mind could alter the brain. A study then followed on the monks that had been training and working with meditation.